Bom dia, Sampa. That's all the Portuguese I know. <laughs> uh, I was here in August and uh, the e-commerce Brazil was good enough to bring me back. Uh, today I'd like to talk to you about your brain and why it doesn't work the way you think. You'll probably hear a lot today about technology, and about the internet and all of the new things that are, are going on. I'm going to talk about the old things the things inside of your head, <laughs> because those don't change. Before I do, I just want to give you a little bit of background about what we do. Uh, at Site Tuners, we work with small and large companies around the world, and we help them to improve the efficiency of their websites or landing pages. And we can do that by helping you redesign them from the perspective of your visitors, of your website visitors, or by doing testing to see what people prefer which version of your content they like the best, or by teaching you and your company to do optimization yourselves. So that's, that's all I'm going to say about that. But I'm going to tell you a story in three parts today. And the first part is about your split personalities and the fact that you have actually three brains. How many of you have heard about the left brain and the right brain? Raise your hand. Okay, so you, that's, that's kind of the, the obvious way to, to divide it. So you have your logical brain and your creative brain, right? Okay, but that's the wrong view. I'm here to tell you that's the wrong view of your brain because that's looking from the top of your head down. And we're only really looking at the big part of the brain up there. That's the one that is the, the newest, the most recent, and it helps us to think, to make plans, to delay uh, rewards so we can get bigger rewards later. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, it helps us to build uh, cars and microphones and computers, but it's not really the brain that's in charge. Inside of that, you have what's called your midbrain. And this is something that we have in common with all mammals. And that midbrain is more about emotion and about liking things or not liking them, about, um, do you ever say, you know, I just have a bad feeling about something, right? That's your emotional brain. It makes a lot of very important decisions. And below that, at the very bottom, is your reptilian brain, or your, and the reason that it's called that is because we share it in common with dinosaurs and crocodiles. And, all it does is, I'm going to tell you more about it, is basically keep us alive. Would you agree that that's important? Yeah, okay. So I want to talk about each of these three brains. Now this is uh, Mr. Spock from Star Trek. I don't know if you have Star Trek down here. Has anybody seen Star Trek? He's very logical, right? Yes? You have? Okay, good. So you, know, you say, so what are our chances of surviving? And he would say 3,225.3 to 1. Okay, he's very logical, calculates everything. So our logical brain is very important, right? Um, the middle brain, like I said, its main job is to feel, not to th reason or to think, but to feel things. Ah! Did you like that? No, that was annoying, wasn't it? Okay, that's your midbrain saying, that was really annoying. I stayed out late last night. That was not very nice of you. Right? That's your midbrain saying that. Okay. And then there's your reptilian brain. And the reptilian brain cares only reacts. It doesn't do anything new. So I'm going to kind of give you a tour of your three brains. But the thing that I want you to understand is that 95% of your decisions every day are made without your reasoning brain knowing anything about it. 95%. How many of you drove here today in a car? Okay. Did, were you, did you drive on, on the road and think about what you're going to do later today or what you're going to do tonight? Yes? And meanwhile, you're driving a car that weighs 2,000 kilograms and can kill everybody on the road next to you, and you're not even thinking about driving. That's how automatic it is. Because it's very expensive to use the big brain. Very expensive. Did you know that your brain uses 30% of your resting calories of your energy every day? 
if you don't move your muscles, if you just rest with your body, your brain uses 30% of your total energy. It's very expensive to use it. So we try to do everything automatically. We try not to use the thinking brain. Okay? And there have been studies, and you can show this on brain scans, where people make a decision, and you can see it in their brain patterns changing, and then one second or two seconds later, they're able to explain their decision with their, with their conscious brain. Okay? But everything, most of what you're doing is automatic and pre-conscious. So here's the things that you need to understand, is that your brain happened you know, from evolution, and it's one improvement on top of another, on top of another. But all of those lower levels are still there, and they're very, very important. So you have three brains, the neocortex, reasons and plans, the limbic system, your emotional brain feels and remembers things and says, oh, that was a loud sound that Tim made. I don't like that. I'll try to avoid loud sounds in the future. And your brain stem, all it cares about is reacting and survival. Okay? All right, let's talk about part two, feeding the lizard, your lowest level of your brain and how it works. I want to tell you about this part. This part of your brain is lazy. It doesn't want to do anything. Leave me alone. Okay, that's the response of your reptilian brain. It also likes simple choices. Small dog, big dog. Very simple, right? If I had two dogs that were almost the same size, no, that's too much work. Remember, I'm lazy. I'm the reptilian brain. It's also very, very impatient. It's scanning the environment, looking for problems, looking for opportunities. It doesn't like to wait. And finally, and this is a very important thing to remember about the reptilian brain, is it's automatic. It doesn't change what it does. You don't have to think about it. It just does things. For example, let's say you touch your finger on a hot stove or a fire. Ow, right? You pull it away. Do you have to think about it? Hmm, that's hot. Maybe I should pull my finger away. Right? That's not how it works. If you touch a hot stove in the kitchen, you'll always pull your finger away. That's survival. That's what, and all of these things are automatic. We don't have to think about them at all. So what matters to the reptilian brain are what in English I call the four F's, okay? And I'm going to walk you through these. So when I'm dealing with somebody or something in the environment, the first thing I can do is flee or run away, right? You look mean, sir. I'm going to run away. No, I'm just kidding. So, but that's always okay. If I'm faster than you, that's good. I can run away. The other thing I can do is fight with you kill you maybe. You guys have some really good MMA stars here in Brazil. So those guys are tough. I wouldn't want to fight with any of them. But that's another one of my responses. The third thing I can do is eat it. Feeding. Right? It's an energy source out there and I can get energy from it. So that's the third F. Feeding. And the fourth F is... <laughs> right? I'm thinking... It, can I mate with you? No? Someone said, no, thank you, sir. I don't want to mate with you. <laughs> Only my wife had to say yes. It's okay. Okay, so this sign right here is the scariest thing in the world to your reptilian brain. But that's only if your reptilian brain could read and it can't. But anyway, the sign is change ahead. Something is changing. That makes me, the reptilian brain makes me very, very afraid. Okay. So this is how it works. This is how the reptilian brain reacts to stuff. First it says, is it dangerous? We were just talking about that, right? Then I have to deal with it. That means I have to fight or run away. Okay, it's not dangerous. Is it novel or interesting? New, novo, right? Um, no, it's not new. Okay. I've seen it before, uh, I'm going to ignore it, because I already know what it is. And only if it's not dangerous and new, then I'll, I'll kick it upstairs. I'll give it to the emotional brain, and I'll give it to the conscious brain, okay? 
So you can think of the reptilian brain as a bouncer. I saw this guy out front, by the way. <laughs> He's not going to let you through. The bouncer doesn't want to make your big brain think. It just keeps things away. No, not interesting. I'll deal with it. I'll deal with it. So you don't get to think about most things. But you're still reacting and you're still doing stuff. You're just not thinking about it consciously. So really, have you heard of the sales funnel? You know how we get people that are interested and then they become aware of what they want. They build desire. They act, right? The sales funnel. Right? So this is the real sales funnel. It's your brainstem. It decides most of the stuff gets kicked out. Then it's your limbic system and your emotional brain. And then it's your neocortex or the big brain, the reasoning brain. And only a very small percentage of stuff makes it down there to be considered logically. So the thing you need to understand about the reptilian brain is it does things the same way. It doesn't learn. It doesn't learn at all. How many of you have bad habits? Come on, raise your hand, everybody, okay? Do those ever change? No. Do you hate yourself for having bad habits? Yes. They're still not going to change. Well, it's very, very hard to change some of these bad habits because they're being handled by your reptilian brain. And it only cares about basic survival. Because if your ancestors didn't care about basic survival, you wouldn't be here right now today. And that's its job. And it's also the gatekeeper for the other two brains. It keeps things away. It decides who to, what to let in. Okay, so you're probably thinking, well, this is kind of interesting, Tim, or maybe not. Maybe you're thinking, I need another espresso. Uh, but here, this part of the presentation, hopefully, will be more interesting to you. This is what you can do with it. This is why you should care. This is why it's important for us in online marketing. Basically, it's how to make money by knowing this stuff. Okay, so I'm going to give you some simple strategies. Number one strategy is create a small number of clear choices. That's the tallest man in the world and the shortest man in the world. They're both adults. Do you know which one is the big one? No? Raise your hand if you know which one is the big one. Raise your hand if you're awake. Okay, all right. Okay, a few of you. Good. It's obvious, right? There's no, no problem to decide. Why did I even make you raise your hand? It's obvious. Well, that's how it should be. That's the kind of decisions our brain likes. So when you have decisions to make, there should be a small number of them and they should be clear. Okay, you're in a pen catalog. Which pens should you buy? Hurry up. Which pens should you buy? Isn't it obvious? Well, how do I decide? Is it by the colors of the pens? Is it by the number of pens? Maybe this one is just one pen, and here I'm getting to choose five pens. Is that right? No, that's not right. They're just showing me they're different colors. So is it easy for me to decide? Are they clear choices? No, but you guys do this all the time in your e-commerce catalogs because your pictures all look the same, right? And there are too many of them. So if you were to show me kind of a close-up of each pen, just show it to me really big, and show me the tip, the front end of the pen, and the back end of the pen, maybe I could see the details and I could see why they're different, right? So if you enlarge it for me and show it to me, that would help me make the decision. That would be a clear choice. But not like this. They're all tiny little pens. That doesn't help me. So what you need to understand about this strategy is that actually thinking about choices is hard for us, especially if they're very similar, like each other. We get tired about thinking. If you have to think hard about a certain decision, it makes it harder for you to make decisions later. So a lot of what you should be doing is helping to guide the consumer to the choice by making a small number of choices and maybe not Filtering. How many of you have filtering on your website? You know, you can sort by price, you can sort by brand, right? How many of you have filtering? Yeah, a lot of you. Look at your web analytics. Nobody is using your filtering. Because 
the logical brain doesn't get involved. When I'm on a website, I'm looking for things to click on. I'm looking for pictures. I'm not thinking, I'm going to go into your filter. Okay, I'm back. Uh, and decide exactly what I need. I'm going to be logical about it. That's not how people think. Remember. So what you need to do is ask some simple questions and have people find the right decision. Don't overwhelm them with choice. How many of you have a page that looks like this? Is, is this too much choice? Yes. It's 16 things I have to choose from. That's about 12 too many. Simple choices. Do you know uh, when you have phone numbers, the biggest group of numbers, how many digits does it have in it? How many numbers in a telephone? Four. Everywhere in the world, the biggest group in a telephone number is four. Do you know why? Because four is the limit of our short-term working memory. That's all we can keep in our head at one time. That's all we can compare. That's all we can remember. And that's why they make phone numbers that way. So don't overwhelm and remove similar choices. How many of you are proud that you carry every possible product in your category? from every manufacturer and every brand. We can drop ship anything, right? We have everything available. That's not good because I don't need everything. I just need one or two choices in each class of products that I'm making. So actually choice can be bad. Have you heard of this idea of the long tail, right? That in search and in, in music and, uh, and things like that, that people, if you give people more choice, they'll take it, right? But that only works in certain circumstances. Choice is only good if you care about something and you're willing to spend the time to look at it. So with music, it's good. With movies like Netflix, it's good. Okay, which new movie should I recommend to you from the long tail of choices? But when I'm looking for pens, I don't care. I don't care about the details of every pen you carry. So removing choices that are too close, that are similar to each other, is a good strategy. Okay, here's strategy number two. Use a big anchor. I don't mean one this big. <laughs> That's a big anchor, but still pretty big. Here's an example. This is a hosting service, okay? And they have different hosting packages. Now, m most of us, do we read from left to right or right to left? Left to right. Left to right. Okay, good. Unless you're, you know, you're, you're, he you're reading Hebrew or something or Chinese, then all bets are off. Okay, but let's say we all read from left to right. What's the first price you see? $2.50, right? Then you see four, then you see six. And the $2.50 package you know, I might think it's pretty good. For me to buy the $6 package now, I'm not going to do it because that has to be two and a half times as good. Do you see that? So if you show them to me in that order, you have a problem. Like uh, when, when I bought this suit, I walk into the, the clothing store, they say, sir, would you like to try on a suit? They don't say, would you like to buy a tie and then try to sell me a suit? Because once I've paid 50 for a tie, I'm not going to pay 1,000 for the suit. Yes? It, it are the, we anchor on the first number we see. There have been studies that say um, if you, uh, we, in the US we have a social security number. It's an identification number. You have something similar in Brazil, I know. Um, if I ask you just right now to think of the last two digits of your number, okay, think about that in your mind the last two digits. Well, they've shown that people that have numbers that end with higher digits, if you ask them to remember that number, they're willing to pay more when you ask them about how much they'd pay for an item. So I've primed you, I've gotten you used to thinking about a big number, and that makes you willing to pay more. Is that crazy? Yeah, it's crazy, but we, we remember and anchor on the first thing we see. It's like ducks. Did you know that baby ducks, the first animal they see when, they, when they're hatched out of the egg, they think is their mother. So they imprint on the first thing they see. It's the same thing here. 
we remember and calibrate to the first number that we see. So we have a software called Attention Wizard uh, that, that we put out that helps you um, basically create heat maps of landing pages to see where people are looking without needing any people, okay? And look, we have the gold package, the silver package, and the bronze package. This one is 197, this one's 97, this one is only 27. So by the time you see something for 197, and then you see something for 27, it seems very inexpensive, right? That's the one most people buy, that's okay. But if we showed them in the other order, it wouldn't work so well. We would never get anybody buying the more expensive ones. So what you need to understand about anchors is we anchor on the first thing we see, even if it's not rational. Do you see how that theme keeps coming up again? It's not rational, but we anchor on the first number we see. So here's what you can do as a strategy. You can add high-end items, make something very expensive. It's not that you expect people to buy it. Have you been in restaurants and you see the wine list? The first wine is very, very expensive, right? Does anybody buy it? Well, only if they want to show off to their date or something, I guess. But most of us, we'd never buy that. But the next one down, which costs probably three times as much as it does in the store, seems, by comparison, like a much better value. So we don't mind paying it, right? That's how it works. Show things in decreasing price order. Like I said, expensive stuff on top. But adding that new high-end item, which you don't expect people to buy, is often a great strategy. And by the way, if they're dumb enough to buy it, put the money in the bank. Okay, so what'll happen is sales of your reasonable compromise, whichever your choice is not too expensive and not too cheap, that's the one that's gonna go up. And if you can at all, like I said, prime my experience. Make sure that I, I anchor on a big number before I even see the real choices. So put something in what I call the lobby of the experience, if you can. It's not a reasonable number, but just say, uh, if, if you came to us and you said, how much do your services cost? And I would say, well, they're definitely well under $1 million. Are you happy now? So if I ask you to pay only 100,000, it's like, a, it's a good deal, right? So if you can just even joke about it or have it somewhere in your presentation before the actual choice you're asking me to make, put a high number up there somehow. Okay, be in my cultural tribe. What do I mean by that? Well, we're all social creatures. There's a lot of research on this. And right now, all of you are members of different tribes. How many of you are members of the blonde hair tribe? Blonde hair. Okay, some of you are members of the blonde hair tribe. How many of you are members of the bald head tribe? Uh, I find as, as I get older, there's more and more members. Uh, <laughs> okay, how many of you are members of the Chevrolet driving tribe? Some of you, okay. So, now, you know, if, uh, how many of you drive a, say, BMW? Anybody? No? Okay. Well, we're working for it, right? But no, but I bet you, you're thinking those BMW drivers, they're just assholes, right? <laughs> Who thinks that? Come on, be honest, right? Yeah, uh, the Chev Chevrolet driving tribe thinks that the BMW drivers are assholes, okay? But not all of our tribes are voluntary. Not, uh, not all of our tribes are decisions. Maybe some of you are members of the orphan tribe. You're, you know, your parents are dead, unfortunately, or of a certain racial group that gets discriminated against. Now, those are not things we decide, but we're still members of those cultural tribes. So you can think of yourself as an overlay of many, many different loyalties, of different affiliations, okay? So why do we care about this on the web? Well, here's a, a website in the U.S. called The Oatmeal, and they have all this kind of funny political and intellectual humor. You can... Um, 
you know, like you can download this ebook, uh, how to tell if your cat is plotting to kill you. Okay, and those of you that have cats, you probably understand that that's a very real possibility, right? Yeah, cats are evil. Um, there's another one, uh, if my brain were my imaginary friend, right? Um, so, you know, this is the people that belong to this tribe are kind of the smart intellectuals that can laugh at themselves. And you can see the, from the colors they choose, to the graphics, to the fonts, all of the choices they make support that kind of editorial tone. You feel at home there if you're in that tribe. Gears of War, who plays this? Okay, a few, you know, Gears of War. This is aimed mostly at 15 year old boys. Some of you are a little older than that, I've played this once or twice. But this is not aimed at the oatmeal tribe that I showed you. These people don't talk to each other usually. These people and these people. They don't talk to each other. Do you see that? These are people that want to take out their aggressions and frustrations and kill things. These are people that want their friends to think they're clever and smart and funny. Different, right? Unless you're going to kill them with your bad jokes. Okay, that's what I do. Okay. Gears of war. So the things you need to understand about cultural tribes is we are tribal. We like to have affiliations. What's your favorite football club? What, do you have a favorite football club? Okay, you guys fight now. Go ahead, fight. <laughs> Kill each other. I don't care. That's your tribe, okay? But some tribes are self-selected. Others are not self-selected. They're, they're choices that are forced on us or a product of our environment. But here's the thing. We care more about the opinions of people that are similar to us. When you were a teenager, did you care about what your parents think? Anybody? No hands? <laughs> Yeah, because we don't. Oh, really? You care about what your parents think? Wow. Okay, you're good kids, huh? <laughs> Do you get the best grades in school, too? <laughs> okay, let's not talk about that. Okay. But we care things about what other Chevrolet drivers think. We don't care about what those BMW drivers think, right? We care about people that are similar to us. So there, you have to look the part. If you want to influence a certain tribe, like my public relations people tell me that every time I present, I have to wear the monkey suit and the tie. Okay, I, I know another friend of mine, Gary Vaerchuk, he runs this website called winelibrary.com. When he does keynotes, he comes out in sneakers, jeans, and a white t-shirt. And he swears a lot. But that's his brand, and he's trying to reach his cultural tribe. That's very important. You have to communicate your values with your editorial tone. What I mean by that is that's the colors you use on your website. It's the graphics you use. It's the language you use on your website. A lot can be communicated so that I feel at home. I fit in with the right editorial tone. And here, this is a very, very important thing. Don't worry about alienating outsiders. If you're trying to reach a certain group, don't worry about what the other people think. This is really, really important. So politicians, when they say something, and they say something that you really, have they ever said anything you really disagree with? Politicians? Yeah, and you think, God, I hate that guy. That's your midbrain, by the way, your emotional brain speaking. And, but you know what? They're not talking to you. They're talking to their political base. They have a message for them. And they know they'll never change your mind. And they're never going to convince you to do anything different. You're in another tribe. So one thing you have to be OK with is offending other people, not making them feel at home. Remember, if you know what your target market is, if you know who you're trying to reach, you should be talking only to those people. Wow, that's an eye, huh? Look at all the detail that we're seeing in that eye. With your eyes, you're seeing that eye. Visuals are very important. Did you know that half of your brain is um, 
visual. It's used for processing visual information of one kind or another. Okay, so here's an example of a visual. This was me in Las Vegas about two, uh, uh, two months ago. What can you tell from this picture? Well, it looks like we're in a casino, right? There's the guy with the bow tie. Uh, there's three other people standing next to him. I have a box in my hand, but it's not the biggest box. So I won second prize in this poker tournament. Okay, do you see how much information you got from looking at a picture? I didn't even have to tell you that story. The picture tells you the story, right? We get most of our information about the world through our eyes and then the brain and how it processes the visual information. Here is uh, Facebook about three years ago. You see that? How many of you are on Facebook? How many are not on Facebook? Or how many are awake and not on Facebook? No. Okay, everybody should be on Facebook by now. I would think one billion people. Okay, this is my wife's profile from maybe a year ago. Do you see how it got much more visual? Hey, there she is with my daughter. Okay, but take a look at this. We had before tiny little pictures of people's heads. Now we're introducing on the left a bigger avatar photo and we're putting photographs in the middle of the page, right? You see how much more visual that got? And this is bef even before Pinterest got popular, but people are figuring out the visuals are very important. Here is, here is my profile a few months ago. Do you see how much more visual that is? Now we have these big giant graphics at the top. We can have a picture that takes up the whole width of our news feed and our wall. Okay. Much more visual. Because it's easy for us to process visual information. Did you know that you can process a picture four to five hundred times faster than letters? So if it's the right picture, it can be very powerful. So half of your brain is devoted to processing visual information. I won't go into all the biology, but, but do you remember, did you take basic biology in school? Who remembers rods and cones? Do you have this? I don't know how to say it in, in Portuguese, but basically you have two types of vision in your brain. Let, let's try this. Um, put your hand out and, and look at your thumb like this. Go ahead, put it all straight out. Look at your thumbnail. That's the only thing that's in focus. If you look at your thumbnail, everything around it is actually blurry. Do you see that? So we have a very narrow 2% view of, with sharp, clear pictures. And so we have to move our eyeball around all over the place. And this happens automatically. You don't even know it's happening. Very fast eye movements called saccades. So your eyeball is just jerking all over the place. And you think you see the world and you see everything clearly, but you really don't. It's constructing it for you. Okay, so that's the, the detail detection. The rest of the world you see like this. Were you guys looking at me? Were you? Yeah, you're all looking at me now. Why? Because I might be dangerous. I could be coming to kill you or beat you up or eat you or mate with you. All of those things are dangerous, <laughs> right? But could you ignore me when I was running? No, because if a, a bear jumps out at you, you need to know now, not in two seconds, now. Do you need to know what color the bear is? No. Do you need to know uh, how big his teeth are? No, you just need to know that a big something is jumping out at you. Okay, let's do another experiment. Put your hands out like this. Try not to hit your neighbors. Okay, go ahead. Okay, now wave your fingers forward like this. Look straight ahead. I bet you can see your fingers. Can you see them? Most of us have 220 degrees of motion detection and it's to help you survive. Okay, so this is how we really see the world. And then our eye jumps around and looks for interesting places in the scene. And then it jumps to another place and looks for more interesting stuff and another place and another place. And out of this, it constructs a picture of the world that you think looks like this. Right? Okay, so now you understand how our visual system works. Why should I care? Okay, well, how many of you, okay, here you are. This is Best Buy. This is one of 
uh, the U.S.'s bigger retailers, kind of like Magazine Luisa is down here, something like that. Okay, so um, you ready? What do, what do they sell at, at this store? TVs, right? Okay, no. Nope. What do they sell at this store? Vacuum cleaners, right? No, wait, wait. What do they sell at this store? Kitchen appliances. No, wait. Maybe it's game consoles. Oh, no. Maybe it's the fact that you're embarrassed because you don't have a smartphone yet. Right? Let's go back. Now, we saw these things changing on the screen. Let me just ask you a question. What was the object in the lower right corner of the screen? Can anybody answer that? Come on, people. I just showed you five screens. What was the object the whole time in the lower right corner? It was that camera. Do you see that digital camera? No, you didn't see it because you were focusing on the motion on the page, right? Your reptilian brain has to react to the motion. One of the, is this one of the four Fs? What should I do with this? Run from it, fight with it, eat it, mate with it. There's only one thing I can't do is ignore it. And so it sends it up to my conscious brain and my conscious brain says, oh, that's just another dumb frame in their banner rotator on their homepage. Now I can ignore it. Oh wait, two seconds later, I have to pay attention again. So it's really, really a bad idea to use motion on your pages. Let's be honest, folks. How many of you have a rotating banner on your homepage right now? Come on, okay. This is your easy how to make money for your company today. Go and take it off when you get back to the office. Okay? You'll make more money. It's your job, this is important, to be the editor. It's your job to cut down the information and make it useful for your visitors. This, I can tell you the, the, who's responsible for this. It's your graphic designer. How many of you are graphic designers that made the banners? Oh, not so many hands. Okay, thank you. Nothing wrong with that. You don't want to be bored all day long, right? It's boring to just do static pages. should be exciting. Something should dissolve or slide in or do something interesting, right? Problem is the focus is on the wrong place. There was a, uh, the American author, Mark Twain, they asked him to do a speech once. And he said, well, sure, I'll be glad to, but how long does it need to be? And they asked him, well, why does that matter? And he said, well, if it's an hour-long speech, one hour, then I'm ready right now. If it's a 30-minute speech, I'll need a week to prepare, one week, okay? And if it's a five-minute speech, then I need one month to prepare. You understand? Your job is to edit down, to make the information easy for me to understand. This is lazy. This is you saying, you might be interested in this, or in this, or in this, or in this. We don't know what the hell you're interested in, but it, it, hopefully it's one of these things that we're showing you. Don't be lazy. Okay. So um, people ask me often about video. Uh, this is a conference series that I run called Conversion Conference. And we have an introductory video on the left-hand side, in the lower left, you can see but we don't play it full screen. We don't put it on the page embedded as a viewer. If you click on it, then you get a nice presentation that, you know, it just shows you a light box popover and shows you the video, okay? That way, you don't have to design around it. It's very small, like a Facebook style video player or video picture. And it also lets me make the choice of playing it. I'm not distracted by motion, I decide when I want to view the video, okay? So video is okay, but just be really smart about how you use it. Okay. And also, how many of you have seen these walk-on video spokespeople? That they, they walk on, they say a little something, and then they walk back off the screen. Okay, that can be very effective if it's short. It's maybe five seconds, ten seconds. Uh, in this case, what she does is she comes out, this is a video company, and says, you know, watch our introductory video. Then that tells you to watch something that's maybe one or two minutes long. Combination can be very powerful, okay? 
But make sure that you pick the right actor or actress, that they have the right script, and that it's very short. Okay. Uh, how many of you have heard of Camtasia? It's software for making you know, videos and easy videos and a lot of things. It's great software. But this is their actual landing page or home page for this product. Can you tell where the videos are? No, I can't either. I'm thinking that it's probably this big mess here, right? Because you have play buttons on it. That's not the video. They actually have the video as a little gray button. <laughs> Was that obvious to everybody? Did you see that right away? No, no, you didn't. So this is too little to tell you that there's a video. Having a postage stamp video viewer, that's the right size, okay? That way there's a picture and a play button, not just the play button. How about this? Uh, this is another interesting thing about our visual system. What are you looking at right now? What are you looking at? Sorry? The, the, the doctor and patient, is that what you said? Yeah. The, okay, these guys. You're looking at the people, am I right? Yeah, because that's what we do. People are a rich source of information. I'm deciding, should I fight with you, run away from you, ask you on a date, you know, right? We're going to look at faces. So we're looking at this guy, and what's he looking at? I don't know. Nothing. What's this guy looking at? I don't know. Nothing. And then after a while, you get tired of looking at them, maybe you'll look at this gray-haired guy, right? Do you know what this company does? Not, not just because you don't read English, but no, because you spent all of your time looking at the pictures of the people. So be very, very careful about pictures of people. Don't use them to decorate your page. If you're using them for a purpose, that's okay. We use that very intentionally because my bald head is very recognizable. <laughs> but look at what's next to it. It's a call to action. We want you to press that button. That's on, in the header of every page on our website. Your calls to action should be clear. Sometimes it's good to draw attention to your call to action. So in the middle of this page, this is about one of our services. Everybody looking at that sports car? That's cool. I bet it's very expensive. Looks like the Batmobile, right? Uh, but then right below it, your eye drops down to the button. So we're not using the picture just for you to look at. We're using the picture to focus your attention on the call to action. Then it's okay. But don't just go to your favorite stock photography site and grab some pictures of people and put them on your site. It has to have something to do with your product, with the call to action. So there are three ways to get information about what people actually look at on your site. How many of you use eye tracking equipment in your work? Okay, a very few of you, right? I know why. How many again? Who's using eye tracking? Raise your hand. Okay, a few people. Okay, it's expensive, isn't it? It's very expensive. You need to buy the equipment. You need to calibrate it. You need to find people to be the subjects of your study. You have to record it all. And then you have to spend your time looking at it. Isn't that exciting? That looking at video recordings of, of eye tracking? Fun, huh? Ah. Okay. Or you can use mouse tracking. Mouse tracking, it turns out that a small percentage of people will actually use their mouse as a pointer. They'll use it to show the cursor on the screen, and you can tell what they're looking at by where they move their mouse. Most of us leave our mouse alone unless we're using it, but some percentage of people will use it as a pointer. Okay, so that's kind of poor man's eye tracking. Or you can use software to predict it. So each approach has its strengths and weaknesses. As I said, one of the weaknesses of eye tracking, you get a lot of rich information, where people look, what order, how long they look at it, but it's expensive and very time consuming. So if you have a big project, you should use it. Okay, it's, it's the best. Uh, uh, mouse movement tracking, here's a form for example uh, over here, or, or menu rather, here's some other menu items up there. You can tell from this overlay of a lot of different people's mouse movements what they're doing on the site. So I could probably tell if they're trying to click on something that's not clickable. You can tell that by recording mouse movement. And here's the final thing you can do, this is I mentioned our attention wizard software, you're welcome to try it. Um, you can upload a picture. And then software predicts where someone's going to look. So we have these hotspots 
where we predict someone's going to focus their attention. So they're not thinking about it. This is during the first few seconds on the site. And look at one of the things they're looking at in this picture. The people. Right? One of the biggest focuses is the people. It's got one big hot spot on it. Uh, so this can be used even without the page being live on the internet. You can just create a design, upload it, and then show it, uh, the heat map of it instantly. OK, so here are the things that you really need to understand about your visual system. One is it's very quick and powerful. Uh, and we are drawn to strong visuals on the page. Uh, make sure that if you use pictures of people, that they're there to support the calls to action. And don't use motion or animation unless it's being used to explain something, unless it's really, really important to your story. And, and if you're going to use video, you have to test everything about it. It's not just, is video good or is video bad? You have to decide, am I going to autoplay it? Am I going to show it to someone that is a repeat visitor to my website? Am I going to start with the sound on or off? How long is it? What is the script? And so on. So here are my four strategies for you. Number one, create a small number of clear choices. That's very important. Small meaning four or less. Okay. Use a big anchor. Use a big anchor, which means start with your highest priced, most expensive thing, even if you don't want me to buy it. Be in my cultural tribe. Speak my language. Look and act like me, and then I'll be more comfortable on your website. And understand how visual processing works and use it properly. Okay, so we've taken a long journey. So here's my takeaway. This is, you know, kind of, you'll have to, I designed this graphic myself. <laughs> um, can anybody figure out what it means? Okay, there's nothing new under the sun. Okay. So you shouldn't be looking for your answers out there. And you shouldn't be looking for your answers in technology. Because the answers aren't in technology. You should be looking inside your brain. We have 100 billion interconnected neurons in our brain. 100 billion. It's the most complicated object in the universe. Your brain. And it's, we're now able to kind of open up the head and look inside. There's a very exciting research on brain imaging and specifically how people react to marketing inputs. So a lot of neuromarketing research being done. So here's some books that you should read. This is by my friend Susan Weinshank. She has been a keynote at our conference called 100 Things Every Designer Needs to Know About People. By the way, this presentation if you, uh, will be available through the conference. You'll be able to, to get all the slides. Another one is by Roger Dooley, who's also keynoted at the, at the event. Uh, it's called Brainfluence. It's a kind of a, a summary of a lot of brain and neuroscience research and what, how to influence people. Uh, Martin Lindstrom has a very interesting book called Biology about uh, some imaging, brain imaging studies they did uh, on, in marketing. Uh, who's heard of Dr. Robert Cialdini? Okay, a few of you. Okay. Get this book. I'm sure it's been translated into Portuguese because it's been around for a long time. This is the Bible on understanding how to persuade people. He did a lot of different research to figure out a few key things that all people react to that helps to influence them, that helps them to make the decision you want them to make. I borrowed a lot of them in this presentation. so. I only steal from the best. And, and finally, my own book covers some of this neuromarketing as well. Oh, by the way, I'm I brought a bunch of these. Uh, so during the Q&A, if you would hand your cards to the front, um, I'm going to collect them and I'm going to do a drawing. I brought about 20 books to just sign and personalize and give away. And we'll announce the winners later in the day. So if you're interested in getting a copy, let me know. And if you don't win one, there's a coupons inside for the conference and Google AdWords. So even if you throw the book away, you're still making money. <laughs> okay. 
uh, if you're interested in the conversion conference, one of the things that we're going to give away, the grand prize, is also one pass to any of the 2013 events that you see up there. San Francisco, Paris, Chicago, Boston, London, or Berlin. And this is transferable, so if you don't want to use it, you can give it to somebody else. Okay, so one pass, to the, go to conversionconference.com if you want more information. Tomorrow, if you're not tired of me yet, I'm doing a workshop at the e-commerce Brazil labs. Okay, it's a very small workshop. We're going to try to keep it under 30 people. Most of them are already sold out. But if you're interested in it, uh, go to that link and, and register, and it's 9 to 3 tomorrow. Okay, and then you'll definitely get a copy of my book because all the workshop participants get one. Okay. All right. Now, at this point, I think we're, we have a, do we have a little time for question and answer? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So we'll do that. There's how to reach out to me. I appreciate your time very much.